Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here with kickstarting champion Michael Kester. Oh, wow. Is that what, is that what I'm going as today? Let's just straight out of the gate on that, right? Because we're, we're literally down to the 11th hour. Yeah. Uh, well, not literally. We're figuratively down to the 11th hour. We have <laughs> several hours left. But when you're listening to this, it may be the 11th hour. Yeah, it's true. So yeah. why don't you give me the movies we're doing? and the awesome Kickstarter. So today we're doing Humanoids from the Deep and Mars Needs Women. And uh, the awesome Kickstarter, that's for um, my band Glitter Mouse. We're trying to get our album funded on the internet there. Right. And we're, I mean, we're pretty close. We're not as close as I'd like to be, which would be done. Well, you're moments away from being done. So what you mean is yeah. you'd like to be closer to your monetary goal, not yeah. closer to being right. done, because that will happen. I can guarantee yeah. you the Kickstarter will end regardless of its success right yeah we need we need a lot more money more money than i have <laughs> right so anybody who wants to donate to our kickstarter the link will be on the what on the website and i'll throw it up on the facebook again i don't even know that i'd say this is probably pretty we're a month into your kickstarter to be correcting yeah. you on this but i don't even know that i'd use the word donation i think they're investing in the album it's pledges they're called pledges Are they? And i don't know that i yeah. i don't know how i feel about that because you're you're basically funding the album. For us, it's investing, yeah. I mean, the way we have our Kickstarter set up is you're essentially lining yourself up to be a producer for the record. Kickstarter calls it pledges. The other thing that you haven't really mentioned on the show is you guys have ridiculous incentives. Yeah. You can basically pledge next to <laughs> no money and exploit the people in the band to do... I mean, crazy things. Yeah, we the one the one incentive that keeps getting keeps getting bought is um, that we will read your your favorite book from start to finish, like in a video or in an audio file. It's ridiculous. Or, or we will reenact your favorite episode of television to the best of our ability. How much does that cost? Seventy five dollars. That's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> that's seventy five dollars. Um, you know that my favorite book is Atlas Shrugged, and it's some twelve hundred pages. There are five of us. We'll get it done. All right. So humor, yeah, uh, you that's, can just go to kickstart.glittermouse.com. This is the last moment to do that. So go do this that. This is. Yeah, it's over. It's over on March 2nd. So if you're listening to this after March 2nd, it's, you're, you're too late. We're going to spoil both Humanoids from the Deep and Mars Needs Women. Yeah. So you can use the chapters that are uh, actually inside the very show itself. That's my favorite way to phrase that. Yeah. Just, you know, click around, figure out how that works, and skip over the movies. Uh, Humanoids from the Deep is not called Monster. What's the, Where's the discrepancy there? Okay, so we've, I know we've talked about this before, but when movies came out in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, when Roger Corman was really making mad bank on movies like right. Humanoids from the Deep, monsters humanoids from the deep they would uh put a movie out and then it would do well or poorly in the box office at which point the uh creators of the film would change the title and put it out again <laughs> <laughs> really um yeah and that's how they made more money on the same film wow so the film when it went to real was supposed to be called monster and I think that was like the UK title. Sure. But then this was, you know, the late 70s, right before video. Right. And so by the time it went to video, based on the commercial failure of Monster, um, and by commercial failure, I mean it made profit, but nobody was talking about sure. it. Sure, sure. So when they put it to video, they called it Humanoids from the Deep in an effort to squeeze the very last blood-sucking penny sure. out of the film it's not the and this often strikes me about exploitation it's not catering to the lowest common denominator no this is a film that appeals to a very small demographic and it uh it certainly has some punches to it well it's fucking violent as hell right which we start the movie with a dead dog right yeah i wish all movies killed the dog just right away kids and dogs yep it's a shock value thing and we've talked about it before but I think what the movie means to say when it does this is, you know, anything could happen. Look how we killed the dog. Yeah, we fucking killed the dog, so now what? 
what won't we do? But the thing about the kind of movies that actually kill the dogs and kill the children is anything couldn't happen in those films. Actually, you know, only one thing could happen, and that's the other characters can die. Right. So by anything can happen, it means anything within the subset of these four people will or will not die. But then you have to keep in mind that this film has the random side children that may or may not get eaten and or raped by the humanoids. Sure, sure right. Big letdown. Piranha style, where we may just yeah. bring more people in or not. Yeah, right. My favorite type is of these uh, these shock value moments or where they really they kind of rub your nose in it. Yeah. I mean, my favorite dog deaths are when they're not shy at all. You know, they show the mangled corpse later. They let the characters get traumatized by the dog's death. Right. It's not just, you know, throw it in the meat grinder and we're done with it. Yeah. It's a weird thing in movies. I mean, that's why I have such a fixation about the dog deaths being a taboo. Because people, you know, people get really worked up about this. Oh, yeah. Some people will not watch a movie where a dog gets hurt. They yeah. just won't do it. Then there's something like Apocalypse Now where they actually kill a cow sure well i mean that's for real we're talking about a totally di- you know that's something we talked about on um cannibal holocaust too right was actually hurting animals but, during the film yeah but apocalypse now is considered one of the greatest films of all time so i guess we'll forego that violent animal death but i don't want to watch humanoids from the deep if they're gonna fake kill that poor puppy well i mean if you want to talk about one versus the other the thing that drives me nuts about that is these people who will not see dogs get murdered in films have no problem with humans being mangled, decapitated. That's, yeah, that's very true. Something we're not taking into consideration, though, is uh, that nothing kills a party faster than bringing your dead dog. Yeah. When you're trying to have a little dance, a good time, uh, carrying a dead dog in your arms, probably. That's very true. Probably not the way to go. No. I do think this movie has a really good tip for exploitation films and something that Mars Needs Women, maybe will, uh, would have been able to use, which is when you need to fill time you just paste in teenagers making out. Yeah. Yep. When it comes down to it, you need to exploit the libido and exploit the blood. It's such an easy thing to fill time, too. I mean, the scenes, you know, they're on a beach and they make out for a couple minutes. Someone watches them. You get in a tent. You make out for a couple more minutes. Yeah. You could really fill about 120 minutes with that. Yeah, well, there are entire Russ Meyer movies that are just topless girls dancing. Sure. I'm not saying that, like, whoa, what a crazy experiment in (laughs) cinema. Right, right. I'm saying, like, if you have an hour to kill, put on Mondo Topless because you won't be bored. Actually, let's uh, let's stay on the tent moment for a second because there's something weird that happened in here that I haven't asked your opinion about yet. Oh, please. As you know, nothing says make out like ventriloquism apparently <laughs> yeah that guy's an actual ventriloquist actor oh wow he's like a big ventriloquist name ah oh, you say that and it all makes sense to me now yeah does it? i was really enjoying <laughs> you the... were the first person in history whose world was brought to life <laughs> by the phrase big ventriloquist name well in my head and i was really enjoying that that brief pause there between when i said that and before i received the information yeah because that's It's like the dog thing. Anything could happen in that moment. I have no idea. Sure. But that's the most unbelievable part of this movie is that they're trying to sell how seductive. Yeah, it's just such a weird. It's a lost art, man. The lost art of seduction via ventriloquist dummy. But it makes sense. It's the um, it's the El Mariachi idea. Yeah. You take the things you have, right? Yeah. So we got this guy. He's really fucking good at ventriloquism. I guess we have him seduce a woman, because what else is he going to do? Yeah, right. He either dies, and what's he do? Has the dummy scream? Well, he was lined up at that party, but they had to bump him for the <laughs> dead dog bit. So right. Yeah, that's true. Put him in the tent. The one other thing I want to talk about in Humanoids is really liking that harp, the mysterious harp score. Yeah. Which is another oh character piece of this that's so strange. It's... um. You know, I think about the moment right before when Jerry has half his face eaten. Yes. They're kind of, they're on the beach and, oh, we we don't know what the monster is yet. We're not sure what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. And this fucking harp, it's, the music just gives this illusion that there's actually a mystery going on when no one would argue there's any sense of mystery at at all. all. None. But how could you possibly call a movie out on being predictable when the harp is trying so fucking hard? They brought that guy on later. Give this film another element. Play the harp. We're going to add a whole dimension. It's amazing how much that actually kind of works, though. You do feel like there's some... I mean, you know there's no mystery, but... We never... And Humanoids is the wrong place to talk about this, so we'll shelve this. But uh, J.J. Abrams did... I think it was a TED Talk on the concept of... um, 
think he calls it the mystery box. Does any of this sound Sounds familiar? Sounds like Call of Duty zombies. He talked about the mystery box being this kind of enigma that a film has. Yeah. The movies could stand to benefit from having just some sort of elements that the audience doesn't know about even if it's a completely fabricated element. Mm -hmm. And that is something that works, even something as, as simple as the score for Humanoids from the Deep, because you're willing to play along with it. You kind of go, oh, mystery. I like mystery. Oh, this is <laughs> What's happening on this beach? I wonder what the mystery is. That's the mystery. But this is all red herring conversation. This is, uh, this right. is we're talking about ladies on Double Feature today. Well, I think with Humanoids from the Deep, if you're going to talk about women, you have to start with the production aspect. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with this whole thing? No, go ahead. Okay, so this movie was directed by a woman. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, I didn't know that. Named Barbara Peters. So um, actually, very apropos, this film was initially offered to Joe Dante. Joe Dante being part of the Corman camp at the time. Yeah. And he turned it down probably to do, I don't know, something else. And Barbara Peters, who was an up-and-comer in the Corman camp, probably just as, you know, I mean, you've, we've talked about this before. She may have been a secretary who was there on the right day. And now she gets to direct. Yeah, right. That that was that was Pam Greer's thing, right? Yeah. So she steps up to direct this, and she makes this movie called Monster. And uh, Corman watches it after she finishes the movie, and he essentially goes, "Um, this isn't violent or naked enough." Okay, so typical Corman right. affair. And so in so here's the interesting part, though, is she goes, "Well, this is the movie I made." That's not what you say yeah, to Roger right. Corman. You don't say, this is the movie I made. If Roger Corman says, that won't make money, you say, well, this is my artistic vision. Roger Corman says, I don't give a fuck about that. This is different than our Gremlins conversation. Right. This really is about yeah. the dollar. And so Roger Corman goes, okay, whatever. That's fine. This is a great movie. Bye. She walks out of the office. He calls in the second unit director and goes, I need you to shoot violence and tits for 30 minutes and stick it into this movie. And the second unit guy says, all right, I... I guess I can do that. Now, this is a man, by the way. Mm -hmm. The second unit director is a male, at which point he splices all the violence and all the sex stuff into the movie. And Barbara Peters and also the lead actress both ask to have their names removed from the film. Wow. I had no idea about this. Roger Corman says, um, no, you're in the movie. So... <laughs> You're going to take this credit, and hopefully it'll help you in your career. I'm painting Roger Corman to be like a total asshole in this situation because— Well, because it's funnier. Yeah, but the reality of the situation is if you're working at— I don't even remember which company this was at this point because he sold them off and bought them at so many different times, but maybe New World Pictures at this point? Yeah, this is. I think New World is okay. what was on our copy of um, it. And so it's about the bottom line. All his movies are about making, making profit or breaking even. And he has a talent for knowing that. And to be honest, Humanoids from the Deep wouldn't have made it on our show if it wasn't violent or sexual. Sure. Because what makes it interesting to me is that it's a violent sexual film directed by a woman. Right. And then you find out later on, no, oh, not, not really. But, I mean, if you want to talk about the exploitation of women via Humanoids from the Deep, the director herself yeah. became a victim of chauvinistic exploitation sure, because she sure. wouldn't shoot blood and tits. Well, and we've seen, I mean, American Psycho, I think, was infamously our right. only other female-directed film uh, on the show, but another movie that's known for sexuality and for uh, blood. But we have, you know, this is a conversation I almost feel like we need to justify a little bit. Because we go through a lot of these movies, and we have fun hanging out with girls in slasher films. We don't think about it too much. But Humanoids from the Deep, I mean, the monsters are after the women. The film calls attention to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's basically saying, hey, look at me. You, you kind of have to talk about it now, right. can't you? But, I mean, just because we can have this conversation about, I don't even want to use a, a term like the treatment of women <laughs> in the film because it sounds so... But, you know, the, the way Humanoids from the Deep treats women, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation that isn't necessarily warranted. I don't think we'd come away from Humanoids from the Deep honestly saying it hurts women or it does any. I mean, it's well, terrible what happened to the I director. Don't, I don't think the average viewer would, but I think somebody who's got to talk about Humanoids from the Deep for 25 minutes definitely <laughs> would walk away saying that. All right. So, I mean, I don't know. I feel like the film, it's pretty harmless. 
and I don't think it's necessarily ill-intentioned. It's not to be taken seriously or right. to be a yeah. super big no, deal. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it, again, it's part of Corman's bottom line movies, and he doesn't. Roger Corman isn't a chauvinist. He doesn't love slaughtering people, but that's what puts your normal demographic in the seats. The target demographic for a, a film, I I was I was reading about this not too long ago. It's very interesting. A child will see anything his older brother will see, but an older brother won't see something his younger oh, brother sure. saw. Interesting. And yeah. a girl will see anything a boy will see, but a boy won't see anything a girl will see. So sure. therefore, your target exploitative audience is the 19-year-old male. And if <laughs> you can get them to come to a movie, you then also fill in the people younger and the girls at the same age. Well, and having said all that, we know humanoids is not on our radar for films that are that are destroying society. Sure, right. But I still want to know, I mean, you know, we come on here, you're right, we talk about films for 25 fucking minutes every week. I want to know how I feel. Of, I've just been brushing this under the rug every yeah. time we do these films and going, oh, it's fun. It's not a real problem, so let's not think about it. Right. But despite that it's not a problem, I don't know how I feel about the relationships between exploiting women on film and the women they exploit. Do you think it says anything about the the female persuasion? I you know, I think and now we're now we are definitely treading in the dangerous territory of heady conversation in an undeserving sure. arena. I love it. <laughs> Let's go full in. Again, if you're looking at your if you're looking at your demographic as the 19-year-old male, Mm -hmm. they're not going to raise a stink. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to a slasher movie because the pains are a little bit more black and white there. Sure. But they're not going to bitch and moan when, you know, a 16-year-old girl is absolutely helpless and running around screaming and can't fucking save herself. Right. But if you put a 19-year-old boy in that situation, your target audience is then going to be like, well, I could have taken him. <laughs> sure. That's bullshit. That wouldn't happen to me. They all have lower voices than me, by the way. <laughs> I've. You think that says something more about the audience then? I mean, yeah, I think, and because we're or about the nineteen-year-old male, perhaps. Yeah, I think because we're talking about an exploitation audience, or rather, an exploitation film, your audience is always going to be who is being affected by these movies. And so, yeah, it's probably negative in that nineteen-year-old males walk out of that movie going, "Oh, women are helpless. Their monsters are going to fuck them if I don't protect them." But, you know, then they probably grow up and, and lose that. See, that's why I think this is a perfect place to have this conversation. Because when are you more focused on the audience than when a movie is being made 100% to cater right. to an yeah, audience? What puts it, when films are made to put asses in the seats, that's when you really look at... No, I think you're dead it's on. when you learn about the asses that are right. going in well, the seats. Well, that's why... And again, I'm going to keep shifting topics because this is one of... Probably the one thing about film that I have the most to say, which is targeting your audience and what that says about your audience. Sure. It's why I hate lowest common denominator, right? right? Right. Because if you're targeting your audience and then your film makes a bunch of dumb and obvious points and, oh, surprise, there's a V there and, oh, V is no Roman numeral five, it's because you think your audience is a bunch of idiots. And that offends me. Sure. Or you take something like Transformers and you put some racist fucking robots in there. Right. And that's... The filmmakers going, well, you know, racism's funny to the to teenage boys. Sure, sure. And so it's funny. I mean, it's not offensive if it's a joke, right? Well, remembering that we're catering to that demographic, I think, can shape a lot of what we think these films say about society. Sure. It's not necessarily saying something broadly about society so much as saying this is what a 19-year-old sees at a movie. Yeah. And when that's the only question it's answering, the implications of that are a lot less horrifying. Sure. Well, and you can then extrapolate like, well, if a 19-year-old male sees 10 of these movies a year, is that going to shape his social outlook? Sure. Well, that's kind of a different conversation, but certainly part of it. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Like, it becomes... If you can focus on an individual demographic, especially something as specific as a single age of a single gender, right? furthermore, of a single country, you can really see what was going on at the time when those movies were being made. You know, we've had this conversation before about nudity no longer being objectifying after the premise, about how we see films with, you know, what a film markets as sexuality but we look at it and go hey no one's masturbating to this right you know this isn't really sexy it's just kind of weird yeah 
And that's true here too. I mean, when when women are naked in humanoids from the deep, there is nothing sexy about it. It's true, but that might not be true to a nineteen year old who doesn't who have as seen wide. Tits. Yeah, doesn't have as wide access to that, I guess, or didn't before the yeah. internet. The internet might change that, right? You know, when you see this in a movie that isn't geared towards that audience, I think it's more in the spirit of exploitative cinema. Mm -hmm. You know, Adam Green might go and make a movie that has those elements, not for the 19-year-old male demographic, but because he remembers being 19 in a cinema and going there hoping to, like, see a nipple slip out Score of somebody's... Some yeah, right? Yeah. So, you know, that draws people. But, again, I don't think that necessarily means there's objectification in the film. Yeah. You know, every time one of these conversations comes up about how are women portrayed in a film, I have trouble figuring out exactly what the right criteria is. Yeah. It's usually, well, are women portrayed in a positive light, which, I mean, that's that's really not a very accurate criteria because then you also have the entire body of femme fatale, and that was you right. know, a poor light, but we've talked about that being an interesting place for uh, female sure. actors in the history of cinema empowering women. To say a man plays a great villain doesn't say anything about men in culture, but I kind of think... Are you familiar with the Bechtel test? I think that's what it's called. It's the gender bias no. in fiction. Okay, so the idea is, and I don't know how, how much this applies here, but uh, the idea behind the test is basically there's uh, if there is a scene in the movie where two women talk to each other about something, and that something is other than a man, it passes this test, right? Okay. And you can go through movies and... I mean, an alarming number of movies don't pass this test. They don't have a scene sure. where two women just talk to each other about something that isn't a man. And the test, I mean, people go back and forth about whether or not it means anything. Real life often doesn't pass that fucking test, so who cares? But I think about criteria like, you know, the Bechtel test for evaluating these films and going, what do I want to see from the portrayal of women in films? Do I want them to be role models? Do we have to demonstrate their intelligence? Is it about objectification? Is it men versus, you know, we've talked a lot about, well, yeah, all the women are idiots in this movie, but all the men are idiots too. Yeah. I mean, when you think about, okay, how is a movie portraying women? Do any of those stick out in your mind? Where do you go to that? If a movie asks, well, is this, or somebody asks you, is this movie fair to women? Or is this a good portrayal of women? Uh, you know, I, oh, man, that's hard. How do you make a criteria for that? I guess I look at whether the the women have strong roles and independent roles and whether they can get on without uh, any male support yeah i guess if they can but, handle yeah. it on their own but like doesn't that also seem kind of offensive it seems condescending to, to, doesn't it well it seems like you're gauging a female's role based on her interaction with women with men sure rather sure that's just as backwards to be like well this woman, this is a strong female role because she doesn't need men. Yeah. Your criteria for whether or not it's a good portrayal of women shouldn't be based on... On men. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it shouldn't have a reference the whole thing point under, yeah. in, in Cox. You know, we have the photographer in this movie who is the token, knows everything character. Right. And so I don't know that I would say that's a great character because that's just... I definitely would not. That's the know-it-all character from any of these films that yeah. comes in and... You know, if it was Morgan Freeman, we'd be bitching about it. Yeah. But it's a woman, and so now we're going, ah, look, the film is saying something pleasant yeah. about women. But she comes in, and she's kind of a bitch. Right, and right. She comes into this, I don't know. Well, she's I also like... a thin character, right? I mean, she's right. just a cliche, yeah. even though it's a good cliche, so to speak. Yeah. I feel like when you play a role of somebody that comes into a town full of people who are obviously less intelligent than you... And instead of, you know, taking it with a grain of salt and going, this is these people's livelihood. They've been here for generations fishing. And instead you go, this is wrong because I'm from the big city. Right. And I know what this is supposed to. You're never going to sure. seem like a good person. Sure. And that's it. That's her role, basically, is to push people around. And that's, that's I guess, supposed to be this skeletal version of being a strong character. But you're right, it's just paper thin, and she's just kind of a dick to everybody. It's the kind of character, I mean, you'd never see a character like that in a Whedon film. You know what I mean? Right. You wouldn't go, oh, yeah, Whedon films have such great portrayal of women. Here's a bunch of women who know everything and explain the plot. It's just poor. I, I guess my answer is just, what would right. Whedon do? Like, I just put that off and go, uh, I don't know, he probably knows better than I do. Let's see, you know, let's see if these resemble characters from his w, films. W, 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 D. Something like that.
Um, let's shelve that for a second and talking about Mars Needs Women, because there's another thing I don't want to get uh, completely overshadowed, Okay, and that is how iconic Mars Needs Women is. Lair Buchanan is the director of Mars Needs Women. I'm just going to paint the scene. Please. Before Mars Needs Women becomes the thing that it is. Yeah. So Larry Buchanan was um, very similar to Ed Wood uh, in his career. We've talked about Ed Wood. He's kind you know, of a, it's funny. I had a feeling Ed Wood would come up on this show. You know, Larry Buchanan is that guy in Ed Wood who tells Ed to make I got a sex change or whatever the fuck that <laughs> sure, was. Sure, sure. You know that guy in that tiny office? Right. Larry Buchanan is the guy that's like, I don't know, Mars Needs Women. It's a movie <laughs> about Martians that need to have sex with women. Right, right. And, uh, and then somebody goes, great, can you make that 80 minutes? And he goes, I can make it 20, and I have stock footage. Oh, my God. Can we talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, if we start out this conversation just in the cement, let's talk about foundations, things we know about. Uh-huh. We know us some Ed Wood. Yeah. And we know some stock footage. Yeah. This has to be the most padded movie I have ever seen oh, in my, my God. fucking life. I have seen stock footage reels that are less padded <laughs> than Mars Needs Women. This movie, the plot is seriously one line that they had to stretch out into some sort of story. I think the moment for me where I realized that the stock footage was because there are films that we've done that show oh there's a spaceship oh there's an f-15 sure, sure. you know there's always it's always jets right jets and military footage are the easiest thing to obtain obtain from stock the moment for me where i was like okay this is, is the football game oh yeah <laughs> there's just a football game going on full-on announcer right watching the plays right and then it every once in a while cuts to a Martian right, like walking right. around in the stands. Sure. And then the announcer goes, ah, let's call attention to this woman who sure. uh, is popular. She's a popular. <laughs> she's a popular woman. Just a guy stalling. Right. And I've never seen Martian, a film stall the way the this Martian does. The Mar cuts to the Martian turning presumably in the direction of the woman. And then back to the woman as she's smiling, unbeknownst being ogled by sure. kidnappy Martians. Right, right. Uh, then the football game ends. I mean, and for me, I was that, looking for, that goes. I was, you know, on, on watch for this stuff. And it's so blatant and there's so much of it. But the one that was pretty early where I was kind of going, what the fuck are they doing? Is all the announcements that are coming over that gray loudspeaker? Yeah, and they just have the same five seconds of that loudspeaker. Uh -huh. So they're zooming in into it and zooming out of it. And <laughs> I mean, they don't have five seconds of it. They probably have a guy yeah. who's getting paid a day rate to sit in a room and film a loudspeaker. It's just you know, shoot everything you could do with this. We're gonna use it yeah. a lot. I mean, that's representative of a lot of these shots. They just sit on the shot forever, forever. And they repeat yeah. the shot. It's fucking gut busting. It's one of my favorite things about the movie. Oh, Just it's fucking seeing, hilarious. It's watching somebody who isn't prepared completely fucking stall for yeah. something. Well, and Larry Buchanan is self-proclaimed schlockmeister. I don't know what that means. I had to look up the word schlock because I'm... Uh, when you type uh, schlockmeister into Google, what came up? I clicked through on Wikipedia. Uh, That's okay. how I get... when when With a word like schlockmeister, you don't You want to play it safe? I want to tell you about my best Google search ever later, but well, that'll be a tease for later. But yeah, since I'm a goyim, I didn't understand what schlock meant. I don't know. I'm so glad I don't have to like have a finger on an edited <laughs> button. If we were on radio, I wouldn't even know what the fuck to do right now. <laughs> Anyway, so schlock basically means garbage, trash. Okay. Just something bad that you know is bad. Right. He's a self-proclaimed schlockmeister, which he just makes stuff that's bad that he knows is bad, but he always turns a profit or breaks even. Sure. And apparently when he died, the obituary in Texas. So first off, to talk, I'm mentioning Texas, the whole film was shot in his hometown because he didn't want to go anywhere else. Right. Why would you? <laughs> um, you got to pay to travel, but, man. You're not going to do that. But, Right, but when he died, the uh, obituary read something. I don't remember the, the person that they quote, and I don't remember the exact quote, so feel free to email us the exact quote, and um, or, you know, fucking don't. But it was um, something along the lines of his art was so bad that it achieved a level of grace or something sure. like that. Like, Interesting. Sometimes art is so terrible that it's... I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah. And it's interesting because this was way back before bad for the sake of good mattered. Yeah. Uh, with video and with 
cult theaters that screen non new release movies, mm-hmm. cult stuff is a lot more applicable to everything else. But you have to keep in mind, this is coming out when theaters are only screening films that are coming out and that's the only way you can see a movie. Sure. And so cult value didn't really apply, but, uh, he was one of those rare breeds that made shit, knew he made shit, and it was just worked out great for him. Well, and it's lived in infamy for that. From the second you hear the scientist deliver that line in the beginning, or the guy in the white coat or whatever, and it's just the flattest cardboard acting. Yeah. It's telling you everything you need. It's like, this is about the caliber of acting you're getting. The message is, Mars needs women. And then the First title. It's, we've got a message. It's three words. I don't care how right. many words it is. <laughs> right. Let's get through this scene as fast as possible. Right. Okay, but we picked up a transmission. The transmission contained a message, as I previously stated. However, this time I will not state how many words were in the message. Well, what did the message say, soldier? It's a full fucking stop after yeah. every <laughs> single. The message is Mars needs. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's the kind of thing, especially when that title shows up. It makes you want to fucking shout to cheer at this movie. It's one of those movies I wish I saw in the theater. When other films call back to this kind of exploitative cinema, they're calling back specifically to that five minutes of Mars Needs Women. (laughs) It really is. I mean, you couldn't. It's almost self-aware. I mean, it's not at all self-aware. It's completely fucking oblivious. But later, when it was self-aware, they would do it beat by beat the way the title to Mars Needs Women was delivered. Right. You know, we talked about stuff with Ed Wood being uh, actually kind of the opposite of a conversation we had on nothing. We we're talking on nothing about what if you were oblivious to the fact you were a bad artist. And we decided, right. well, maybe that was a bad idea. But Ed Wood would have had no career. That's true. He was oblivious to the fact he was a terrible artist. And that's why he was what he was. That's why he made that's all true. of that. In his lifetime, though, he had no career, which is sad. Sure. That's the thing where, again, to flip that back on the other side is maybe he would have fucking started a flower shop. Sure. And not been beaten down his whole life. And all that could have been. You have never fucking known. Granted, his legacy is absolutely gigantic. Sure. But at the time when he was making these shit movies and he was doing a terrible job, everybody just kept telling him that. Right, right. And that sucks. I mean, it does suck. I I don't want to I don't want to bring anybody down. But, you know, Ed Wood died and then he's in the ground getting eaten by maggots and worms. And meanwhile, we're like, that guy was great. Yeah. But while he was while he was walking around doing what we have now deemed great, we were all like, dude, what the hell is your problem? Stop making movies. Knock it off. But he had this enthusiasm and this passion that was, you know, it burst through everybody else telling him how much he sucked. It's about vision. If you have the vision and you're set that that vision is worth your pursuit, Mm -hmm. basically, fuck everybody else. I'm making Mars Needs Women. Well, and so with Ed Wood, those were things you would see. He'd try and make little jokes that wouldn't land, and it would be cringeworthy, and he would persevere through all of that. And that was the thing. I mean, I've told you before, I don't enjoy fucking anything, ironically. That was the thing I genuinely enjoyed about Ed Wood's films. But with Mars Needs Women, I mean, it's even another level. Mars Needs Women is a completely serious film. It doesn't even try and make a fucking joke. Not even the Ed Wood style jokes that don't land. Right. But this has literally not one fucking joke in it. Yeah. And that's a big part of its cult appeal is how seriously it takes itself. Sure. It almost plays like a romance film, like some kind of drama, if it had been executed successfully. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's these yes. Martians, and they want to, one finds true love, and but not a fucking wink or nod the entire yeah. time, completely straight, and it became the best example of this kind of cliche, yeah. of this thing, and I think on Double Feature, we should just call it, you know, Mars Needs Women. Yeah. That, because it is- That's fine. This is a type of genre that I don't know if you'll ever see it done more purely- then here, yeah. where it is, we have nothing but this concept, so it's 100% of what our film's about. We're playing it completely straight, and we don't even know that it could... As if they're unaware jokes exist. As if there's no way any... Anyway. Right. Not one guy sure. goes, hey, uh, what, what if people don't take this seriously? Right. Shouldn't we have some... No. No, it's all serious, because our stock footage is serious. We don't have... <laughs> we don't want to pay another guy to come in and be the joke man. We didn't write any jokes. I'm not paying somebody to write jokes. So this is part of why I wanted to have a lot of the conversation about how do we evaluate women in films with humanoids. Sure. Because by the time we get to Mars Needs Women, 
I'm starting to get this idea of where these things are coming from. Sure. I mean, this is a really, it's a strange genre cliche to go, how did, how did you position the, um, the theme of today's double feature to me? Um, things not of earth need to fuck earth women. Right. Right. That's an actual genre. Yeah. That's not just, we're all making jokes about the film Mars needs women. But there are other films that take themselves fairly seriously. Right. I would argue perhaps none as well as this one, and some perhaps more subtly. Yeah. But there's tons of them. There's a whole, yeah, there's a whole thing in cinema about, I, I mean, I don't know, man. It's almost a pornographic idea, yeah. right? It falls basically in the same realm as bestiality. Sure. Where people like to watch things that aren't human try to fuck women. Sure. Um, that's what we're doing. So Let's not sugarcoat it. <laughs> that is, it's part of, uh, I mean, it's just a cultural idea that's out there running rampant. Sure. And that's what everybody wanted from King Kong. <laughs> is, that, is that part of King Kong too, I guess? I mean, in a much classier kind of way. Yeah. It gets to, you know, in this movie, and they are trying to be classy, it's Earth's most desirable women. Sure. So we can go back and forth with that criteria of, you know, is Mars needs women bad for women? or Right. And I think the film does, too. It doesn't know what the fuck is. You know, I think I better stop acting like a woman and start acting like a scientist. Right. Or, so, or start acting more like a woman and less like a scientist. I think that was the line. Right. You know, so that stuff comes back and forth, too. It's a bunch of people's confused ideas about women in society. Right. But I think this is also, you know, for a lot of our audience, it might be hard to think about this ever being a serious premise that films try to sure. conduct. But we have this today with more with impregnation, I think. Sure. Films like we talked about uh, Alien vs. Predator right. um, way back, one of our earlier Killapaloozas. But that is Alien, isn't it? I think in a way, I think that. The difference between something like Alien, which does this in an unbelievably tasteful sense, mm -hmm. and again, and to go back, gives us probably one of the most powerful female roles in cinema history. Sure. I think that these films, again, going back to that 19-year-old male, are contingent on men wanting to not even, I almost said protect, but I think it's just claim. I think it's just trying to pander to a 19-year-old boy going, don't let Martians fuck your women because right. they're yours to fuck. Sure, sure. There's that kind of ownership. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of the mentality that it's, it's gearing to. And I think that in, I mean, I think that as we grow as a society, something like Alien stems out of that where instead of it being a dichotomy of men protecting women or women losing, it can eventually fall into women protecting themselves for the sake of men. I'm going to throw something even crazier at you. Oh, please and I do. want your opinion on this because this might just be me totally out of nowhere, right? We're talking about these cliches that exist. Yeah. So, you know, there's aliens having sex with women and chasing the women around and capturing the women. And that falls into even the damsel in distress type of abducting your woman you got to get her back sort of idea yeah. but that's evolved into aliens getting women pregnant and sure when we see something like that in you know ridley scott's alien i mean there's such uh terrible writing at a conceptual level with these cliches that you think yeah uh there's no way you could ever make a good film and then you make something like alien and not only does it have like you said one of the crowning female roles in cinema but it also is at its core, at least has that cliche in it. Sure. And so we've come so far that I don't know that in today's day and age, if the, I think the cliche still appears in movies because it's been there. And so it's kind of a classic thing. Right. But when this was happening in the fifties, you know, I'm going back to the invasions of the body snatchers, uh, Rosemary's baby sure. conversation and kind of going, well, what else was happening in the fifties? You know, what were we thinking about? And, you know, the civil rights movement is going on in yeah. the 50s and 60s. Sure. And, you know, there's also a cliche we've never talked about, which is black men are coming to steal my white women. Yeah. Well, that's that's I mean, those are some of my favorite movies. But you talk about King Kong. <laughs> and I mean, if that is what King if Kong you is. had asked me King Kong. what cliche yeah. is King Kong, I mean, that's it's not one we like to talk <laughs> about because it's so fucking ugly. Well, right. <laughs> Yeah, have you by any chance? Um, do you watch the the show Key and Peele? No, it's uh, Jordan Peele and Keegan Michael Key. They're they used to both be Mad TV um, 
cast members, but it's similar to the Chappelle show uh-huh. in that they come out, do a little bit of stand up, show us, show like a digital sketch that they did a little bit more, you know, a, a sketch that they filmed and whatever. Right. They do all these sketches that are really, they're very racially sensitive, mm-hmm. but because of where they fall in society, they can do it. Sure. And it's really tasteful, in my opinion. People <laughs> sure. hate it. Sure. Some people are right. very offended by it. But they talked about how uh, at, at a party one time, some guy just walked up to him and was like, you know, I don't even like King Kong, a white guy. I don't even like King Kong because it's fucking racist. And they're like, what? And he's like, you know, it's a symbol of the white man taking the black man from his home and bringing it to New York. And, right. and then he tries to take the white women. So the, the white man shoots him down. I think it's racist. And sure. they go, I didn't know. I didn't even think that about King Kong. Right. Well, and I, I always fear that territory because I go, am right. I reading into this too much? Well, that's much? the point. That's the point I'm trying to make is King Kong is totally, even if the filmmakers didn't intend that point, it raises the question. I wasn't trying to back you into a corner and go, <laughs> right. ha, now you're racist. <laughs> right, right. I was instead trying to defend you and go like, there are two total separate groups of people. Some people think King Kong is a movie about a giant monkey. Right. And some people think King Kong is a movie about race relations you know? yeah well and it's something that's really it, it i get more and more interested in talking about this because it's such a taboo and there's all this white guilt so people don't want to talk about it and it also sounds absurd yeah. so there's all these things like you know that, i mean they wrote a sketch about it it sounds absurd yeah, right i link it to civil rights uh not just being a, a huge you know racial episode in the country's history but you have to think about a lot of people who are opposed to civil rights are now thinking okay well it's it okay so think about gay marriage right yep the big fear on the socially conservative side is well these gays are going to get out there and ruin my marriage uh-huh. you know they're going to take something that i knew worked and that was precious to me and they're going to fuck it up and i'm thinking the same thing probably happened with civil rights we start letting black people go out and vote and go do all these things and go to our dances black people are going to steal my women sure well there's um a- again just to reference pop culture, are you familiar with Body Count, Ice T's metal band? Uh, you have talked on the show before about Body Count, I think. One such hilarious and very potent subject to talk about race relations and stuff like that. Go and listen to Body Count's There Goes the Neighborhood. Sure. The entire song is told from the point of a white male. Mm hmm about how upset he is that black people are playing metal sure because that's like the last sacred thing for the white male and now these black guys are on stage playing guitar better than white men and now they're stealing all the women and there goes the neighborhood sure well and i said i wanted to mention my uh my google search uh for you my bing internet search oh yes please but so in thinking about this and going, well, before I talk about this on the show, let's see if anybody else has ever had this idea and I'm not just fucking nuts and going to say uh-huh. something where you go, Eric, what the hell are you thinking? So I, you know, I go on my phone and uh, I get the robot to type in uh, black men coming to steal white women. Uh-huh. That's now in my search history in my phone. Yeah. And I learned such crazy things about backwards modern society, Michael. Uh- <laughs> they are terrifying. There's, so what I expected to come up was like maybe people looking at cliches in movies oh, or please tell me there's like official government websites. No, no, no. It's all like Dear Abby type. Oh, really? People writing in worried that it's all message boards of people with this legitimate concern Man. in the last couple of years. I mean, modern people. I wish. Who, I think the only thing that could have been better is if you were just like, it's just a series of Yahoo Answers. Well, that is kind of what it looks like. It's. A, I was just yeah. going to say, it's Yahoo Answers pages that all start the same. They all go, I don't have problems with interracial couples, but are black do you guys think that black women? Men are, but you know what's great is it's gotten progressive because that's not the top one I found. It's not even in the top five. Most of them are, don't you guys think that white women steal all the black men? Or don't you think that, you know, wow. yeah, it's all of these weird different mixtures of some kind Ooh, of spin I don't, on. I don't know if that offends my my sexist problem or my racist. Problem. Sure. Yeah, it's weird. So it's I mean, what it says, and this is actually why this is amazing about humanity and not terrifying. It's talking about people's insecurities. It's why we lace this in a science fiction film. Sure. Because during the 50s, everybody had this concern in the back of their head or some people or next to no, I don't know how many people I wasn't around in the fifties, 
But some people had a concern. They go, man, you know, yeah, I'm really for civil rights, but I'm really fucking lonely. And is it a good idea to invite all these these other potential male competitors to my dance and steal sure. my women away? Right. And, you know, so you don't talk about it because it sounds like an awful concern, but it is this primal thing in you that goes, sure. ah, competitor in the fields. Right. And I think I think when you go on the internet and see that women are concerned about it, men are concerned about it, black people are concerned about it, white people are concerned <laughs> about it, it just means that we all have inadequacies and we fear anybody, anybody coming to steal our women. I have in recent moments pulled up Larry Buchanan's obituary. I see that there. If I may, uh, if I may just read that. Please. To close this out. Great. One quality united Mr. Buchanan's diverse output. It was not so much that his films were bad. They were deeply, dazzlingly, unrepentantly bad. His work called to mind a famous line from H.L. Mencken, who, describing President Warren G. Harding's prose, said, it is so bad that a sort of grandeur creeps into it. Our website is doublefeatureshow.com. Our email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Send us your thoughts about everything from today's episode. I, you know, I want to say I'm going to tear down all of the great uh, groundwork we've laid here and say I'm really interested in hearing from women. Yeah. As if I didn't learn anything. But the truth of the matter is that I just want to continue using Double Feature as a uh, vehicle to pick up ladies. <laughs> so you know what i like talking to him more that's fine now everybody write in because i do want to know what do you we raised a lot of this was a really heavy show yeah raised a well, lot of points of conversation i want to know what criteria people use if you pick if you pick hard-hitting films like this you're <laughs> right. bound you're bound to have a heavy show want to know what criteria people use to evaluate women in films when they think about it because i know people in our audience fucking think about it even though we can probably all agree that Again, neither of these films are really hurting women at all. But, you know, you want to think about it. Um, I want to know everything about coming to steal our women. Uh, I just want to know. Um, also, your Kickstarter is going to be on our website. There's a short link to get to that, too. Yeah, you can just go to kickstart.glittermouse.com. Kickstart, one word. Yeah. Kickstart.glittermouse.com. Kickstart. Yeah. Uh, in, in the final moments, I would really, it would be great for me if I could point to our show and go, look, Michael, people from our show help your band. Isn't that great? That's true. Uh, so seriously, Podmanity, don't let me down. You'll make me look like an asshole. Uh, what are we doing <laughs> next time on the show? We're going to revisit the Marx Brothers in a non-Hitler atmosphere, which really opens us up to talk more about the Marx Brothers because I won't have any grounds to talk about World War II. We're going to do uh, Duck Soup and... Indie game? Indie game is your pick. I'm I'm a little bit unfamiliar with indie game. Indie game is, uh, I'll tell you exactly why I wanted to do this. Because it's our fucking show and I want to watch indie game this week. Yeah, that's how I, that's why I picked Duck Soup too. <laughs> well, so we've had a, right, bouncing off this conversation, I guess, we'll just go right into another one. We've, for a long time, just kind of made fun of our audience that's uncomfortable with gaming culture and sees it as not art or not worth talking. They equate it with, you know, people talking about sports. It's off topic. It has no relevance. Yeah, which is horrible. Who would ever talk about sports? It's boring. Um, a totally different kind of artistry, sports, than gaming. Uh -huh. And only slightly different gaming to film. But I wanted to challenge our audience this week. Uh -huh. This indie game movie is about indie game development. And I think it's a really good movie. And it really makes me feel for the people who make these games. And I think it's also really interesting to show to people who aren't into gaming. So I kind of wanted to challenge people who completely... The people who write in and scoff off gaming every week. I'm not asking you to go play games and give them a try. But maybe watch Indie Game. Hear what we have to say about it next week on the show. And we'll see how everybody feels after that. Uh, I guess so. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>